Well, we're talking about uh, South Coast. It can't go without saying uh, rest in peace, fire. And yeah. um, and uh, the moon, um, that that whole a- era of graph, which you know fired for so me. You know, the moon, that was me and two other individuals were on our way to something that was happening because of a certain inability for something to operate <laughs> for the day. <laughs> okay, we were going okay. somewhere destined to do something. There's certain things that aren't able to operate. Yeah, maybe shouldn't have been able to do. Or shouldn't be doing, but we were going to for the interests of cultural um, movement. <laughs> <laughs> Do the math, yeah. <laughs> um, and we're going past Shoreham on a double decker coach, and I see with the two individuals with me, we see this holding pen of some like this dockside kind of yeah. thing. It's massive. It's like the size of two or three football pitches, wide and big. Huge. And it's got like 40, 30, 40 foot walls and like high. And I'm like, I've earmarked it. We're like, we all said that that'd be amazing as a Hall of Fame, right? <clears throat> so I've got on a bicycle that week because I wasn't driving at the time. And during the week, I went down on my own and I've looked at it and I reported back to the others. Found something. The Killer Killer Podcast. Killer Killer Official dot com. <laughs> Street Culture TV. Instagram UK Frontline. Beatbox created. Killer Keller. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast live and direct Central London. God damn it. Central as you need to be. You don't want to be anywhere else. Anywhere else, it will cost you a fine. And, uh, God knows how many hours in parking space. Um, big shout out to all the sharers and carers, people that have been, you know, clocking us from the jump and keeping us out of trouble. Uh, we thank you. Um, our sponsors, the mighty GK Nifty Heads, have a massive 100,000 play to earn NFTs to give away to the streets. Just hit the link in the description or go to gkniftyheads.com and get ready for Hot Awards Summer 2024. Inside the house today is a history lesson, no less. And serves you all right as well for being so young. Um, big shout out to everybody from the South Coast because it don't get much more deeper than this. We're going back to the legacy holding of hip hop right the way through to Graf with a gentleman that has experienced it all, all from the beginnings, from beatboxing to DJing to the rave scene and has been a conduit uh, alongside many others in the graffiti field. Yo, big shout out to Joel Primecast. You are inside the place. How Hello, fella. How's it going? Well, yeah, good. Nothing but love. There's going to be a lot of people out there going, how long did it take you to get on the podcast? <laughs> oh, no, 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 thanks for this. Thank you. Oh, it's been Sincere a blessing, though. man. We've, we've had a few uh, yeah, conversations, to say the least, prior uh, to us getting yeah. in here. How are you? I'm good. I'm really good. Really happy to be here. Really stoked. Thanks for the invite. And yeah, nothing but love. You've got said, a whole yeah. heap of history. Yeah, it's all right. I've had some adventures. It's been really good. It's I mean, been really fun. To compartmentalise that into four, 45 minutes or so. All right. It's, 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 a, it's a liberty, isn't it? To, 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 to say that, you know, we can start a story so far beyond. I mean, and I say that, you know, we're not talking age here. We're talking about intel, knowledge. Yeah, it's just a funny thing. Like the music was the first thing in and mm. it was like that whole cultural, um, typical 80s story, Buffalo Girls, That's mm. that kind of thing, mm. the introduction to the scene, it landing on the lap, the Electro albums, the Electro 6 happened, mm. Dougie Fresh mm. and then the Fat Boys. I remember getting the Fat Boys album with Stick'em on it and everything like that. And I remember I used to walk to school with a Walkman on and I used to beatbox, and I taught myself to beatbox, listening to that Dougie Fresh, wow. fantasising, because it was a long-ass walk. It was four mm-hmm. miles to get to school, so eight miles a day with a Walkman. I hurt my ears, <laughs> and, and I got all right at beatbox, and I started hanging out with certain people. I was the only person in my school in my year, other than one guy, God rest his soul, John Kelly, that was into hip-hop after the whole breakdance Big scene and Kelly. died. Yeah. So... I stuck with it, listening still religiously, Mike Allen, Radio London, all of that. And I just didn't realise I was any good at beatboxing or whatever. But I remember hanging out in the town, befriending a few people from outside my school, the usual Saturday mm-hmm. McDonald's hangout kind of thing, St George's Centre, Gravesend, big up. <laughs> and salute! <laughs> and I used to 
entertain people in the car park stairwell, you know, all concrete, tomb like structure, get your neck in the in the corner of the building yeah. and just blow people's minds with lip resonating bass kind of thing. Lip action. And and I remember this girl, Tracy Dixon, she's like, I've got a mate who's who's really good at scratching and he'd love to meet you. I'm like, oh yeah, no, cool. Didn't think nothing of it. About two weeks later, as I'm holding court again in the, you know, in the understairs car park, or un- yeah, you know, she's like, Geezer wants to meet you. His name's Joel. He's a really good scratch DJ. I've told him how good you are at beatbox. You need to meet because I think it will be really good for both of you. So it's like a blind date. <laughs> I got sent to his house. And I remember him, he was wearing a white hoodie. He opened the door. Sniffing each other's asses right. and stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hip hop, hip hop <laughs> introductory. <laughs> so I just remember opening the door and I remember my first thought was like, it looks like a hamster. <laughs> Sorry, oh. Joel. <laughs> but it was like instantly, as soon as we met, within seconds, we bonded. It's like the love for the music was there and it was we were on the same page. So we were on the you same then? wavelength. I was literally taking i was the last year of gces so o levels last year of o levels then it became gcses so he was a year younger than me so he had he was about to go into the fifth year and i was about to go into the wide world and we hit it off we became instant best mates it was just like and he had two rappers from london chris allender big up we ain't seen you for years old tight and then MRG, otherwise known nowadays as Mr. Offkey, who's hmm. Hmm. a yeah. soul collector, like just oh, one, of, one of my, still one of my most blessed people to have in my life, right? And now residing in Bournemouth. So we all, they lived in East London. Joel had his dad in East London, mm-hmm. but his mum in Gravesend. And I, I, at that point, I moved to Gra- um, sorry, from Gravesend to Sittingbourne in Kent and didn't know anyone. So for the next six months, every weekend, Joel's mum kindly let me stay at his gaff. Wow. So we really cemented the music thing and that's where Kissy K used to come down. Still to this day, one of my closest mates, Dusty in the background. Big up Dusty. Yep. By the and way. and time, still Dusty. again, spoke to him yesterday, texted him today. He was meant to be he's... here today, yeah, Dusty. Yeah, yeah, Where yeah, are yeah, you, my friend? Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise engaged, helping some people out. But... Cleaned up the sofa and everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And what, like, I really value these friendships still. Mm. It's really important to me. Well, they last forever. This yeah, is, this is they the thing. do. And I've moved, I've been transitionary. I went to Ipswich um, with a friend and... Uh, we went up, he had a girlfriend up there. We went on a whim on a weekend, mm. thought it was a laugh, met up with some graph people that were really heavyweight. Mm. Um, I ended up moving out there with him. Just thought it'd be a crazy thing to just spin a thing youthful around. Youthful wisdom, and just, you see, youthful wisdom. We were like, fuck it, we'll do everyone's head in and just move to Ipswich. And the people we moved in with, one of them got in the IG Times um, one of the first people, if not the first people, to do a train in England. They're like Essex writers. What? And uh, a guy called Z3, who, you know, I, I ended up moving in with him. And what, another flatmate of his was um, a guy who from Black Dog, the techno group, and then now they're mm. known as Plaid. Mm-hmm. So Andy, can't remember his surname. But anyway, these were like... Informative seriously, times. Yeah. Older than me, but... Just like really blessed people to be around, and they got me into raving. I, I dropped ecstasy for the first time and turned my back on hip hop because of them. And but I very dare you. And and <laughs> I, I influences an important thing back in those days was when we didn't have the internet. Any little bit of magazine or TV, mm. you'd amass it, absorb you'd keep it, it yeah. and you'd library it. Yeah. And there was a thing from the Sunday Telegraph, Colour Supplement. It was about graffiti. And that's where I learned about Artful Dodger and all of these people, how they used that pink. Where did that pink come from? And found out in that article, it was Buntlack. And so that's the first time I knew where they got that source, that pink from. Because you couldn't find it at Halfords. Do you know what I mean? So pink was rare as rock and horse poo. And it was, was, um, yeah, it was Buntlack. And 
that interview that it talked specific it talked about these guys from Essex that did this train and in particular one guy called I think from the Urban Bombers from Basildon a guy called Mezzo 46 and I ended up painting with him in 1989 he was like the first warehouse party dancer that got paid to dance on rave what? stages like Sunrise 4000 before it even made the yeah. that massive Sun newspaper campaign. He was already dancing all those. What all sun, those well, hold rides. on, wait. What sun? Sunrise. Sunrise. No, but what was, sun music camp? What what campaign? Sun. What do no, you mean? The, the sun sort of went hell for leather against the warehouse scene. Right. That acid criminal house justice rave. bill and now, before that it predates really? that. So there were all these like things in the sun. There's a famous newspaper clipping of a load of guys on uh, on a dance platform. They're all Ipswich guys. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so it was like millions of foil wraps from ecstasy tablets. It wasn't, it was a glitter bomb, but they sensationalized it. And, wow. But uh, let's be honest, <laughs> everyone you spoke to, <laughs> it was, it was, everyone was on E and it was incredibly naive and sincere and everyone was like, well, this isn't drugs. This is just a thing that makes you happy. Yeah. So that, that kind of changed the sort of landscape. Did this change the landscape for graffiti? Yeah, it did. It really yeah. did. In in mostly it was a detriment to graffiti, but then there were there were those like myself that kind of looked at mm. taking substances and doing artwork and pushing the artwork whilst having been affected by this cultural revolution. Mm. And then and I found a lot of um, inspiration from that. Talk to me about the beatboxing time, because I've got yeah. a, a small affliction for that sort of thing. So, of <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. so, so, so what, was the, what was the beatboxing scene like at that the time? The beatboxing, I didn't have any links to anyone else. So I used to beatbox for uh, uh, Joel and our, our group, our little tight little unit and so we'd do stuff around Gravesend I'd do under 18s dis look like discos it sounds awful but it's people like Eddie Gordon and Steve Walsh that were doing these things they were big movers and shakers right. in the dance music and soul scene and hip hop scene at the time mm. they were pushing house and hip hop and so I was getting up on stage doing stuff like that and it was it was good fun and um you've always been integral to the culture you know with with beatboxing graph DJing, the rave scene. I mean, these are your, you know, informative years. And you've, how, where did that gravitational, where did that gravitational pull come from? Um, it was the wholesale packaging of this thing that was incredibly exciting. It was hip hop. Mm. Even though I moved away from, I, I remember saying I'll never, like to the guys that took me to my first rave, they prepared me for a month before I took my first pill uh, and were like, you'll leave hip-hop. I'm like, I've been hip-hop since I've been 14, mm. so 1983, so it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I remember coming up on this ecstasy tablet to Farley Jack Master Funk and Lynn Collins' Think rendition. I remember it, I'll never forget it. And it's like I went up to Z3, I went, I get it. <laughs> I get all the bleeps. I understand what it's about. This is, this is mm. amazing. Mm. And it's just like you're at one with everyone and... You know, of course, it's fake. Yeah, it's yeah. not real. But at the time, at a time where you were really oppressed mm. and you weren't allowed to be out later than 2 o'clock mm. in the morning, suddenly you're part of this burgeoning scene where it's going against the natural mm. order of things. And it's an incredibly exciting and relevant culturally yeah. time to be around. Yeah. And it changed everything. And it, I was no longer... I detached from hip-hop other than graph at the time. And... But uh, I remember Bambata, like, yeah, I know he's <laughs> alleged kid no, fiddler. Oh, heard stories. Yeah, yeah so I, I'm not into Bambata per se now. Yeah. But he's coined a, a thing that always stayed with me. It's not, hip-hop isn't a music, it's a feeling and it's a mm. thing. It's 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 about rocking. It's the expression of rocking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but yeah. That's always stayed with me. So, and, and I'm sure someone like Theo, Snatch. Yeah. Big up, Snatch. So, you know, it's he brings the hip hop to what he does. Yeah. yeah that's it's it. a style of delivery, it's a yeah. cultural language. Mm. So, everything you do here, it, you don't have to be into hip hop to be relating to this. Mm. It's just part of street culture, mm. it's a method of expression, it's a, a vessel. 
mm. to get across a, a, a notion. Mm. Um, I love that sentiment. It, it, but it is. It's it's like like I, as an adult, as I got into studying and and you know, I really leaned on looking at social setting mm. and set and things like well subculture. It should be celebrated, whatever it is, whether you're mm. a metaler or if you're a goth yeah. or any of these things, they're all relevant. They happened because of something in the atmosphere mm. around a certain group of people the, and early, it facilitated the, yeah, something. Yeah, because they're early adoptees, aren't they? Yeah. Of what will be the, the forthcoming of, yeah. of mainstream. Yeah, and it's like... You have the whole thing like the new romantics, they happen because of something, because yeah. of someone putting on a David Bowie fan yeah. night in yeah. a certain place and and suddenly it's a load of people resonate. Mm. And, and I think it's a surrogate family mm. and this is what it is and this is why it attracts people that, that um, you know, you get like in the graph thing, like myself included, we're, we're all from broke, not all, mm. but mm. there's some kind of hardship, social hardship, oppression, uh, home life might be fucked. Yeah. And, and so, what it, and it's no different to say, or anything like football hooliganism, anything, any kind of tribal dance mm. that you might partake in is really important. Tribalism. Yeah. It's really, really fundamental to, mm. to, um, you, you flee the nest and you find your own path and the people around you at that point become really significant in your life mm. and developing as an adult, whether that's for the better or for the worse it doesn't matter. It mm. still shapes you to who you are. And that may resonate with you for the rest of your life. And that's played out in things like musical reference points. Mm. You know, like the old skinheads from the generation above us. Scar. They'll still, they'll still listen to that music. Northern they'll soul still things dread, like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. They'll always be that. And I'll always mm. listen to Sucker MCs till the day I die and just yeah, go, well, I'm with you, that is cold. Yeah. I'll say it. My goose goosebumps. Like, my goosebumps. Yeah. And it's... Roof, yeah. It's really vital. Subculture is, is vital to those that didn't have the most beautiful, pristine of <laughs> yeah, paths absolutely. through life. It's really important. Um, graffiti reappropriates itself within different genres and different fields. Nowadays... Um, to be a, to be a graph artist, and this is only through the podcast I say this. So, you know, there's there's so many subcultures that are intertwined, like skateboarding and yeah. graph. You know, it's in my mind, it's one of the same. But for a lot of people, it's like, well, actually, we're into Oasis or we're into you know hard house. Similarly, I can't identify with skate. I, I appreciate skating. Yeah, I, I was BMX. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so different, a different thing. Entirely. The war continues. But I, but I don't, yeah. I don't. Resonate with skating, and that's cool. Yeah. That's fine. And but I understand that's part of the you know for those that are into skating, mm. it might be punk, it might be hip hop, it might be both. Mm. They're really vital, and that's part of the essence of their. Or, or sorry, that's part of the zeitgeist that they're experiencing mm. at that time. And it's it's all really important. It's all really important. Mm. It's your experience with your peers. That's what's real to you. Anything outside that, you might choose to embrace it or you might choose to deny it but what you have is real mm. what you experience that's real for you and that's really important and it's the recognition that you know hip-hop may mean something to this cluster of people and it might mean something completely different to this load of people isn't that interesting it yeah. is interesting because yeah. it's the same shit yeah but the very social demograph of these people here might be different to those mm. these might move and shake in their way and resonate yeah. through the scene completely credibly. But these guys here might not like that because they're more real or they've suffered more or they're, or, or they're able to participate at a higher level or at a more true level. So you've got these differing factions mm. and, you know, all of it should be celebrated. And some have more kudos than others and I, I get that and that's cool. And, and it's like, and I'm talking about people, for instance, an easy one is to say, People that grow up in the tube system in London, they're hitting it correctly. And and I celebrate the importance and true to the gameness of everything mm -hmm. there. My experience is completely different. Um, not utterly. But still true to the principles, the core I've, principles. I've, of... I've flirted with the traditionalities mm -hmm. of graph. But I, I, I understand that I can't compete with someone that's gone 
tube yards for the whole life mm. and dealt with people dying and, and dealt with mm. a certain lifestyle I couldn't begin to imagine. Well, I, I can begin to imagine, but I can't ever experience. Mm. And so salute to them. Yeah. Big um, Nothing plays out more than the podcast because after, you know, God knows how many episodes, you do catch a, 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 a more broader understanding of how a culture like graph or hip hop is reinterpreted depending on your social circumstances, places in the world. Yeah. Um, New York, you know, the 1980s yeah, yeah. and the fact that it's even, it, f it flew over almost like a, <laughs> almost like a, um, um, a desert storm. And, it was and, a pre-packaged thing. Yeah. If someone put, I can't remember the exact wording, but it was like an airfix kit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was in spray can art. And yeah, I yeah. thought that was perfectly perp. <laughs> it really was. It, was it, it arrived on a lapse and we could assume it to the interpret or to, to, the, to the rule book, the guide we appropriate book. The guide it to, book. Yeah. Well, we appropriated it and some people were truer to the game than others. Mm. And, you know, it's like there are some things that, you know, you look years on, decades on, you see people that choose to paint in a early 70s style mm. because they feel it's true to the game. Mm. And there is no correct thing. And, and so this, that stuff looks much more significant and relevant to the true form of it. And that's cool. And I think that's really kind of letting go of the ego just to be traditionalist. And yeah. I think it's really important, really important. Um, and then there are other there, there are other sides to it. There mm. are people who rock the halls of fame, and and there, there are different motivations and different reasons. And and I think all of it belongs. Yeah, you could argue that some of it isn't as real. And I myself, I put myself in the I'll rock up with some friends, and I've heard people put this down. Mm. And I, frankly, I don't care. Mm. It's like we all take part. And we come at it at the angle we come at it from. From an age range in which yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. at the time you didn't realise, you know, being so young, because my guy I'm has I'm not done... talking about young people looking at it because they can't relate and I can't relate and because of the age difference and disparity and social... So mm. I, I'm not in London, I'm mm. on the South Coast. So. No, but from a point of view of as you, as you grow into the culture and bear in mind, mm. you know, 50 years of hip-hop, 60, 70 years of graph... Yeah. Um, of course it's going to be adopted in a different light as you grow with your perceptions of the culture, as, as you grow. And your life journey as yeah. well, because that will flavour it. You might go down a different route completely mm. to where you thought you were headed just mm. because of marriage and social circumstance and that opens Things and stuff like doors. That. Yeah, yeah. And, and that might take you on a different journey to what you would have thought you'd gone on. And all of it's relevant and yeah. irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> so... Yeah. Ipswich, KMC. So, right, okay. So there's me with our little group um, and I've got a mate, Aviator, Mark Gaskill, God rest his soul, mm -hmm. passed in 96. And we took it quite hard when that happened, but that's that's a different story. But so um, he and I went on this little, He was he was a bit of a, lovable rogue mm -hmm. so he ended up in a halfway house after being released from custody in Ipswich and garnered himself a very pleasant girlfriend and we went up to visit her and her crowd and uh, this is 89 and went up there and then me and him on the return from that we met C3 and all these guys that are culturally significant up there mm -hmm. and uh we decided to move up there just to do everyone's head. That was it. That was the reason to do everyone's head in Gravesend. Just we damaged. went up there. We left um, and up sticks. And within a few days, like, I did, like if I go back to Red Lion in Gravesend, was a culturally significant hotspot, and there used to be hip hop days. And I remember me and Joel and and our MCs. We performed at the Red Lion pub as part of a bigger bill this American rap group from Ipswich came down. Don't know how they got hooked into it, but they did. And anyway, so fast forward, we've got up to Ipswich uh, quite coincidentally and I'm absolutely stoned around some friends that who, who we were staying with around their house. 
And uh, this manager from that rap group turns up and yeah. he's like, oh, Mark, I heard you here, staying here. You, you scratch a bit, don't you? Um, KMC, they've just sacked their manager. Do you want to come for um, an audition? We need a DJ, DJ to perform on, with just cutting a record. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, okay. So I'm like, oh, can I come along? I'm stoned off my nut. And, <laughs> and so I've gone along and they didn't like what he did. And I said, can I have a go? And I did it. And they're like, whoa. And they're like, what's your name? And I went, Euro with an H at the end, and they were like, whoa. And they're, they're like, KMC, the rapper, he's from St. Louis, yeah, Missouri. That's right. yeah. So he, his sister-in-law was one of the secretaries to Louis Farrakhan, so he's really involved headlong into black consciousness. Yeah. And he's like, you're over the H, that's Hannibal, Hannibal conquered Rome, you're in. <laughs> and it's like, wow. suddenly, suddenly, I'm, I'm in straight away. My my little audition was cut to record. Um, and and you got signed <laughs> yeah, in? Yeah, I was there, I was part of this group with this like... There's a moral to this story here, record, kids. Recording. Wow. Yeah, yeah, when, when zooted and you get the offer, <laughs> just go. Just go. <laughs> <laughs> wow seize the day <laughs> incredible so um yeah we ended up supporting krs1 bristol beer keller two thousand people um i got carried off stage because i played a lewis farrakhan speech at the end of our set i didn't eat I, and suddenly i was lifted up and and everyone it was just the weirdest thing i'm like whoa it's just our b-sides second track on our b-side you know wow and 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 did the pink toothbrush in um Essex with Karras One using Scott Rock's turntables, you know, after he'd passed. Then give me a handshake on that, <laughs> please. <laughs> wow. Then then also Incredible. Colchester University, strangely. There was five UK dates of that tour and we did three of them. And it was just mad. And I was like, oh. And we we got Daddy Freddie's manager, a guy called Offman. So he was married to one or with one of the Wee Papa Girl rappers. Big up Daddy Freddy, by the way. So, wow. yeah. And and so we had a load of stuff. We, we turned up for uh, Def 2 at Camden Palace. Mm. We were there. We missed the sound check because of messing about and traffic coming from Ipswich. So we got to hang with Adamski's friends, Entourage, whilst they performed. We, mi- we couldn't be on TV because we missed our slot yeah, yeah. for sound check and 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 then most famously we had the poll tax anti gig which was at Brixton Academy um we were on like our MC who was all about about black consciousness and was super articulate um one of my biggest role models in my life he was mm-hmm. an incredibly intelligent guy um and yeah this guy Kevin McCurry who was just like just he was a street poet and ended up a rapper. Yeah. Um, he came to Ipswich and landed this record deal, and he was extremely articulate. Like he knew exactly why the crack academic, ep- epidemic yeah. had happened in New York. He named politicians and people that had destroyed yeah. the black ghetto systematically. So he was switched on, and yeah. He got invited to the pre-gig com- press conference, and Rebel MC was in attendance. Big up Rebel MC. Yeah, I'm tight. Um, and everyone was gauging because he was the flavour of the month. Mm. But the press just honed in on him because of what he was saying and stuff. And we were going to ditch our set, and I was just going to spin two breaks. So I remember it was two copies of a depth charge release, <laughs> right? And I remember mm. that I didn't have decks at, at my gaff. I, I was going to the record label's studio mm. and practising. What I didn't realise, they had these autophon cartridges mm-hmm. that weren't spherical, they were ellipse. So they're more hi-fi. Autophon so they, are the needles that are on the... On styluses. The yeah, that's right. So it was carving the records twice as fast as a normal cartridge would. So by the time <laughs> we did our final show, the yeah. final rehearsal... On the, the the Friday night, and here's me. I'm shitting myself because it's like I'm not really. A, it's prime cuts. Is it? He's the DJ. I just had a bit of a scratch. Wow. So I'm a beatbox and a and a DJ for this group, and and yeah. So to just to say, I wore out the records, and there weren't any in Ipswich to re, that I could get hold of to replace Shite. it. I got accused by the group of sabotaging it on purpose, and it broke my heart. Hmm. And it's, it really wasn't. I was wholesale into it. Yeah, anyway. 
wow. politics destroyed the group. We didn't do that gig at the, mm. uh, at the, um, at the you know, the yeah. London gig. Yeah. It didn't happen. And it was just like... I got blamed for sabotaging it, and I was completely innocent. So just to clear the slate clean here, that that was not the case by any stretch. Yeah, and it's such a shame because, mm. well, you know, it's one of those. We were one of the, We had everything set up, ready to go to America upon proof of pudding in the UK. Gutted. And we did some things in, like, I mean, they were older and they weren't really connected to hip-hop as such. Mm. I knew about hip-hop because mm. I was part of that. Yeah, yeah. They weren't so much. They were jazz musicians and poets mm. and they really, they sort of were riding the crest of a wave and taking the opportunity. We did a few shows and I remember being a, um, an attempt at a UK fresh type of thing with a load of UK acts uh, it was in South Hall in 89 and we appeared and I remember my my group introducing me as the best DJ and beatbox in the whole world to a fairly volatile of mm, that time yeah. London crowd yeah. and everyone just booing. And yeah, here's the bus, think, jump under yeah, 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 it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, why did you just say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. need to say that. And yeah, so the... the so you had an inkling that this really wasn't... Yeah, 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 yeah perhaps. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and it's, I still am in contact with Kevin. He's back in the States now and love him to death. He's one of the most pivotal people in my life. Mm. I, t I learned a lot from him and I, I want to give props to him yeah, right now. Yeah, big up that, big up that. Um, Four Star General, because that was the, around the same time yeah. trips, which where you kind of... <laughs> Let's, let's talk about Four Star General because that as a place was just an yeah, amazing... So we're talking Carnaby Street yeah. times. And at the time, I I was travelling down from um, the, the, the stalwart of hip-hop that is sitting born in Kent. <laughs> <laughs> hail up, hail up. Hey. I, I was coming down uh, to London with Joel and everyone and hanging out. Um, and that was one of the places to go to, and, and I'd see they were doing custom graffiti shirts. So I was just like, me too, I can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it gave me a, a break, and I did them for about six months. I wasn't mm -hmm. as good as the others, but you had Crime Ian, and you had Wild Child Ricks doing stuff, and Vassan was was yeah. also part of the, on, um, the, the, the staff there, and George, so big up to all yeah, of those people. Um, and I did them for a while. So I did that, and that really, for me, as an out-of-towner, that felt significant. I was, you know, showing that you could be bumpkin and, for the and some relevance. Yeah, you know. yeah, and also it was a different kind of, uh, it was a different kind of um, medium, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. A whole different kind of medium for its time. You've, you, you're, from what I am led to understand, you're very good at repurposing yourself into... And and I think a lot of it hails to, you know, going with intuition. You know, the, yeah. the, the core inside you is, well, this morally, the compass, you know, your, your dial ain't swinging too much. This is the right way to go. Yeah. And that's very much your compass, isn't it? Yeah, and it's it's kind of, it it, it, it goes back into the, the, the hardcore graph writing, mm. I suppose. It's, it's the same sort of thing. I'm not saying I'm a hardcore graph writer. Um, I'm saying that the hardcore graph writer will just go, like there's an opportunity. I'm going to do that. I'm going to put a bland there, mm. and 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 they'll do that. And then and it's just you can take that to all threads of life. Mm. It's the same thing. And and it's like you see an opportunity, you just go for it. Mm. So the DJing thing landed me with a recording contract. We ran up at that time, 1989, twenty thousand pounds worth of recording studio time, Jeez. and it was all paid for. Wow. And and so we did really well, and we were about to go stateside yeah, upon yeah. proof of pudding in this country, and it didn't happen. But you know, it's like we were almost ran. We went to Pinnacle Distribution was the people that were putting that's out right. our label's stuff. So they, I think they were Sid Cup or Elton that sort. They were, sort yeah, of, that's yeah. Right. And I remember us going there for mm. a birthday or some sort of thing of celebration they're filming it for video and we turned up in a Saab convertible all in suits we looked like gangsters <laughs> and everyone was like who the fuck are these guys and you had people like Hazel Dean and like and Mr Blonde and Mr Pink and everybody yeah out. and it was like you had contemporary chart artists there and everyone thought we were something special yeah, I love that, that but that it was amazing it was cool and big beauty. up John Sharp from yeah. Pinnacle Recuts because yeah, he, that, that he produced a couple of our records and V Marshall from Blues and Soul magazine. She was one of the hip-hop journalists in that. 
and she came down to do a story on us. Like Hip Hop Connection did a story on us. We had a photographer assigned to us for three months and, and oh, all of this. And man. so it was living it up. Man. And, you know, it was, it was fantastic. Well, they weren't nothing. I had some amazing memories. That's all that matters, you know? man. That's yeah. all that matters. Brighton was beckoning, though, wasn't it? That was a yeah. That was a real kind of. I mean, you know, this is where this is where I kind of come in in my uh, my uh, early informative years. You know, you you uh, uh, along with a plethora, plethora of other people mm. that that really uh, get, gave me the fault lines of mm. of not only graph but you know just the behavior the mm. behavior and and how again going back to your compass mm. what is morally because you had the rave scene mm. you were djing but then the, the graph thing as well and the way that brian just had a thing going on didn't it yeah for real it was mad and so all of this because i was doing so much stuff in ipswich i was doing graph uh, and and all of this and um I've got no way of quickly saying it, so I'm just going to just cut out a load of stuff and just say I had to move house and there was an opportunity for me to move. The only place I could find was actually moving to Eastbourne and then on to Brighton from there. Right, gotcha. So that's what I did. I arrived in Brighton having found that there was an amazing graffiti scene in there when I moved to Eastbourne. So we're talking what era? What uh, 90- 1990, yeah. autumn, I got arrested for DJing at a warehouse party in Brighton. Um, a big thing in an old Schweppes bottling plant. I got nicked as they shut the rave down. I then had to answer bail, so I borrowed a flatmate from Eastbourne's scooter to, <laughs> to get over uh, to answer bail. And I decided to, I, I remember seeing um, a place in Hip Hop Connection in Brighton. I was like, I'm going to seek this out. Mm-hmm. Graffiti, you know, go and do some spotting. Because I hadn't done any graph in Eastbourne. And I was like, whoa, you know, I need to scratch that itch. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm missing it. And I found Black Rock and it was Sheen Wreck and Zinc. They were the standouts. And it was like, and Jay Dell had a piece down there, mm. Chiba Wizards crew, and of course I knew them from the Hip Hop Connection photos. And I was just like, mind blown. It was like, these letters are like mine, mm. but these are really good, mm. like scary. Two colours on whitewash but wild styles and like to a level that I'd only seen in subway art. Two colours. It's just, it was insane. And and so, yeah, anyway, I, I went back, mind blown, started sketching loads. Then I put on a night with, I'd started to make inroads DJing wise in Brighton and I put out, um, there's an old venue called The Asylum, which became known as The Loft and then The Lift, I think. Yeah. Uh, going back years, but mm-hmm. Brighton venue put on a rave called the Rolf Harris Cartoon Club <laughs> with a picture of, I designed the flyer, it was Rolf Harris's face, it was my DJ partner Chaos from Eastbourne. We used to do all the big raves, Storm and Passion mm-hmm. on the South Coast, mm-hmm. Hastings Pier, Brighton and all of that. And um, put this flyer out at Roundel Records in Brighton and Rolf Harris plus some graph lettering and Rick won worked behind the counter. I didn't know that. Mm. And he's gone, who did this fly on? I went, me. And he's like, I'm Rec One. I'm one of the main ambassadors oh, of graffiti for this town. Man. And that's where I linked with him and got in touch with him very shortly after that and moved to Brighton. I could have either come to Brighton or, or, or London and I chose Brighton and got in with him. Huh. Suddenly I had a circle of friends of other writers and they had this scene going on. We used to meet at a place called Biderbeck's in the north, oh, sorry, in the lanes. And we'd have writers benches at a pub uh, in a beer what? garden. And we'd sketch. That's where I met Fire. I met uh, a writer at that time called Curb, who was Train King at that time. Um, and Slab, who went on to be... Uh, T- uh, movie title artist mm-hmm. in you know in the film industry in America, and and all these other cats that were just fly as fuck. And mm. sh- I can't underestimate meeting she and Rec. That that they their study of subway art. They deciphered every letter style that floated. They were serious boat. cats, man. They were ridiculous. I, I've got to add gravity to this. She won in 91, had over 21 black books. What? He used to sit 
he'd have an A5 black book and he'd, every time you saw him, he'd be sketching. He had it like an illness. He had to write his letters. That's why his letter forms are so bloody good because he just didn't stop sketching. And I really adopted that. And Rec was the same, but Rec was a bit more like she had his one tangent he was going on and they were battle letters. Yeah, they yeah, were yeah. not, they were kind of... Aggressive. They were aggressive, born of... Chrome Angels letters yeah, 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 crossed right. with subway art, like maybe uh, you know um, uh, Dondi, mm -hmm. you know that 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 kind of flow, yeah. just perfection. And Wreck was a lot more fluid, a lot more talented, flow. and incredible. These two guys, I remember seeing their work and thinking, well, this is exactly like my sketching, but mm. they've gone in and learnt more before me mm. and I really aspire to be on that level and there's so much more to this but that's for another day but yeah that, that I was inspired and so we became this crew called Colour Cosmos Crew yeah. uh, which didn't last very long it was literally CCK. yeah everyone that did graph mm -hmm. was in on it and then after a while as history has served to show actually it was wreck and Nima that put this crew together and essentially it was the biggest hitters in the crew and it mm. expanded to other towns. Mm. Petro became part of it. Carl and Temp from Manchester, big up to all of those guys, especially Petro because he's, he's one super gifted guy. Who became... One you guys, mellow fellow. But you guys did the shop as well. We you... did the shop. I came in on Petro's shop mm -hmm. And that was at Worms Paint. So first of all, it was at Suicide, which is a skater shop. That's what, uh, but then it, uh, Mex opened up his hip hop uh, and break. Big up shop. Mex, by the way. Yes, indeed. Oh, Nothing but love, love, love you, Mex. Fantastic love you. fella. Um, and Petro wanted to shut up shop because he was going travelling. I bought into the business, so he carried it on, and it didn't last in the end. But mm. and, and the, kind of the the, the the flow was that. Rare kind used to come for our, to us mm -hmm. to order paint. And in the end, they came to us and said, can we start up? Because we hear you're thinking about shutting up shop. And I sort of said, yeah, here's my blessing. Carry on. And then they went and did many great things. Wow. Because they were more yeah, on, yeah. finger more on the pulse. Incredible. They were the right age. History right yeah, here, yeah, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So wow. nothing but love for Daz and all those crew, mm -hmm. that crew. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, so that was that was... It was a really good time for Brighton. There was lots of things going on. Arrow was doing his thing with his crew, Daz and his crew doing their stuff. And there was us old fogies, us old timers. Man, Brighton was just such And so a we became, like DFM place. got shut down. Nima called time on it mm -hmm. um, because there was a certain thought that it needed to be more hardcore, less walls, more about realness. Mm -hmm. And And so that happened and then, you know, they went off and they they formed TPG, mm -hmm. which went on to all sorts of stratospheric crazy things, craziness. Mm -hmm. Which big up that was just a, a mad time. For yeah, and if you want to check out TPG as well, then, yeah. and we've got Kings and Toys on the on the channel as well. You can check that out. So that was crazy. So <laughs> yeah, it was a crazy an era, amazing time to be around. And we we were sort of like we had some really gifted people. I, I remember I put score into DFM. Hmm. Like he came down, his his mum had a business in Brighton and so he used to grace Thailand quite a lot and I bumped into him one day mm -hmm. and we hooked up, exchanged numbers, the usual sort of thing and then I went and painted this place that uh, was running as a hall of fame for about a year or so. And Tana Land or another place? No, this is a totally different place near near between the Sainsbury's on like London Road sort of mm -hmm. Lewis Road area. Um, yeah, there was, there was like an old waterboard place. Mm -hmm. uh, There's a big old building with tiles, and so me and she painted the whole thing out together, like load of uh, bandit and banshee pieces and and a I was yeah, I did some wow. ret stuff at the time. And uh, so I invited Score down to do that with me and I did an arete and he did a score. And I was like, do you want to be in DFM? And he's like, yeah. So that was that link. DFM, made. man. Wow. It's an important time and yeah. we had some serious letterists at the time. We had some 
ridiculous talent for lettering. Yeah. And, you know, for me, it was always more about style. I, I, I honed in on that. And whether that makes me bad or good in some people's eyes, you know, there are others that carry the torch for being real. I love letters. Mm. I love letter form. I love get that. That for me, it's about lettering. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter where I'm doing it, as, whether it's a sketchbook or on a wall. That's my that's my get off. Mm, mm, that's mm. what I like. And so, but I, I I embrace all of the rest of it. It's and you know I but I understand that some may see me and be like, well, it doesn't really matter. That's quite superficial. But you know, that's cool. It's like there are others to champion being. Traditionalist, yeah, man. You know, and knowing that's your all lane. good. Knowing your lane. Knowing, knowing my lane. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. And, and it's like I'm not as relevant as some and maybe more relevant than others. It, 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 who cares? Mm. It really doesn't matter. Um, and, yeah, I hope that comes across all right. <laughs> is, that, is that... No, that, yeah, it does indeed. And is that is that age and wisdom being applied there in that thinking? Yeah, perhaps, because I did all of the naughty things as well. Yeah, we'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> but, yeah... You've done everything. Yeah. Like, what have you got to prove? Yeah. I, I don't know. But, you know, I could have carried on with those that things. That's metaphorical, was, by the way. Yeah, that yeah, was, yeah. That was no, a but, but, yeah, but it's, <laughs> you know what I'm it's, it's all relevant. Yeah, absolutely. And there, were, there were markers that happened and where I made choices and I backed away from certain things. And maybe I was doing too much. I've always had two things going on. I've never done one thing on its own. Mm. And maybe that's good that I can multitask. Personally, I don't think so. Mm. I think if I had one thing, I would have excelled. But I haven't. I've been pretty good at a couple of things at once. It's funny <laughs> you say that because, you know, there's, there's, what you just said there definitely applies in the case of myself because, you know, we're busy. We're doing yeah, stuff. Yeah. and But we have this, it's this creative charge in us that yeah. we want more. It's the same shit. It's, yeah. it's like I, 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 a really good analogy is when you write music and you're using a computer, you're working with a timeline, you might have 16 tracks. Yeah. It's no different to a video artist. He's mm. got 16 tracks and a soundtrack and mm. all of that. And it's the same shit. It's working with a timeline. Mm. Two different mediums entirely, but it's the same same dynamic. It's the same creative process. Mm. I, I'm a painter and decorator by living. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's an itch that's scratched. I don't need to do it. And there's been massive swathes of time where I've not done anything creative because my job satisfies me because it feels the same. Mm. You take a shithole and you make it look nice. It's the same shit. You're rocking your... Within lane. a timeline. Within the yeah, timeline. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, maybe not necessarily a timeline, but you're taking something, you're polishing a turd or mm. you're, you're extracting something and making it yours, mm. your thing. Mm. You, you know? Um, and making style out of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That that kind of thing. It's 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 just putting energy into something and coming out of it in another way. And I think that's what hip hop is. It's manipulation mm. of energy. Oh, yeah. It is. You know that that's it. Yeah. That's it. Whether it's an MC or a dancer, or you know, it's, it's you. Whatever you do, you strive to be the best you can be, mm. and you rock your shit, and you do it with swagger. That's hip hop. Mm. It's combative self expression, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Does that get lost nowadays? I don't know. I'm not anyone else. And and my peers come from the same fold. Yeah. So it's hard to gauge what that is. I, I suspect that people come through with their nuances, mm. their landscape, and so it evolves. Yeah, it does, A bit it? like language. Yeah. You know, I used to come into London in the late 80s. You'd hear youths speak in a certain way you come back 10 years later they sound different mm. it's forever evolving yeah it is isn't it you know you remember things like words like peng coming in yeah. you know when it was my time it was safe mm. you know in gravesend there was a local word log if you're an idiot you were a log <laughs> you know things like this it's yeah. just like it's all relevant <laughs> They can still apply now, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but the, 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 it's all relevant to yeah. where you are at that time. And it's just that energy around youth and and, and or life mm. in that stratosphere. And and yeah, it's it's you observe you observe street culture. That's... I do, but I'm I'm a fan of social. I, I'm a fan of sub subculture. Mm. I find it inherently interesting, whether it's punk or goth, mm. or I, I I'm not one of those. Mm. I'm not into that, but I love that energy. What creates that? It's what 
what what are the ingredients, the components that cause this little faction of culture to erupt mm. and become something that's quite dominant for a while, perhaps? Yeah. It doesn't have to be, but there, there might be something really interesting about it, whether it's skinhead and scar or two-tone or football uh, hooligans and stuff like that. I, I watch so much on YouTube about different things, mm. condi- social conditioning that that invites this 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 void to be filled and you get these colourful characters that that move and shake in their own resonance. Yeah. And, and and it's I think it's wonderful. That's what, it what is I wonderful, enjoy. Isn't it? I love seeing that and, and trying to understand what makes you tick that way. How do you take your ego out of that as a as a participant? It's ego well? driven, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. How do you I, how does Euro how does Euro remove that ego? But you have to understand well who we're talking to here. This is fucking Euro, right? We, we're talking about a man. He had a scratch named after him. You know what I mean? Like, you, like you've been part and present of all the fault lines. How do you take your ego away from that and, and look back and say, yeah, yeah, that's right. But I right. think the ego is part of it. It's a pseudonym. It's like I was Euro the graffiti writer. I had good letters or whatever, and, and, and you know, people knew me for doing X, Y, or Z. And it was relevant to that little social circle. None of it matters, by the way. <laughs> it's just some people might look on, upon it fondly. Mm. And and then it becomes important to those people for a reason. Yeah. And we're a part of that, graciously, happily. Really pleased that's to be a right, part of yeah, it. But yeah. just let it move. That's right. And that's what it is. It's like you can get very fixated about... And it all depends how your drive is fueled mm. perhaps mm. um i i don't know i just i got into stuff i was around certain things that happened like the whole scratch do you mm. want to talk about oh, that oh i want to talk about the scratch okay so there were some really important things that happened in this country and of course tony and joel have alluded to this mm-hmm. and and Taken it apart and and told you why and it's scratch perverts yeah sorry all yeah, day I should have said yeah, yeah absolutely big up and I was obviously being omnipresent friends with Joel uh, I got to meet Tony and they used to come and gig in Brighton and stuff like that and they uh, Joel and his then misses and then the later misses. Obviously, I've known them really, really well, but him and his old missus used to live at... Not live, sorry. He used to come and stay at my house for the weekend when there were gigs. And so we spend all this time and sell one from Gut Snipes would come and big hang out snipes, and stuff. So, one, yes, Stuart, big sell. Yeah, nothing but love again. Um, yeah, so there was this thing going on. The, the whole scratching thing was happening, and I remember Joel showing me... This is pre-Vestax... Mm is part of the conversation here. So I Vestax remember Joel, was a mixer that he used to yeah, use. Yeah, it was the first mixer that had a VCA crossfader. So it was a voltage-controlled amplifier. So the crossfaders of old used to have the signal running through on a carbon strip. So physically, the, the fader would go from deck one to deck two, and it would be done on that strip of the fader travel. Mm-hmm. So those would wear out really fast. So you might get a mixer, and within two weeks your crossfader's gone. So yeah. you'd employ WD forty to to get get conducting again, yeah, and yeah. eventually it would die. And you'd have WD forty so. sprays was as important as a spray can at this point. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, if you don't have a WD forty for this crossfader, then yeah, you're, 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 then you're not practicing. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's not happening. So um, up to this point, there was no replaceable crossfaders. So it was a whole unit. Mm. So. So I remember like DMC released PMX2, I think it was called, um, mixer for the DMC competitions. That's right. I think Pogo and Swifty developed that. Mm -hmm. Um, And essentially, Joel was showing me this new scratch. I remember it was a Babu shortcut and um, D-Styles tape. No, sorry, it was Melody, Babu and Shortcut. All right. And Melody comes on scratching the good from the not bad meaning, meaning bad, but bad meaning good. And he does this thing and he's flaring <laughs> with it. And it's, but it sounds like it's swinging and it's just weird. And Joel deciphered it and was like, this is what you do. It's like, it's inside out. 
it's an unnatural fader movement. So he showed me how to do it. So I was like, cool. And I was playing at, I was playing at free parties out in the fields on, on the downs in Brighton, which were a big thing back in 96 or whatever. Mm -hmm. So he's got these flares down and then suddenly Vestax come out with the 05 Pro. Pro and I, yeah. I, my mixer was an 05 Mark III or, or Mark II. This was before the Pro. So it was like a made to, if anyone remembers from those days, big up made, made to fades. Vestax had an almost identical mixer. And that was the 05, the original. And so suddenly there was a crossfader that didn't wear out. And it was like, whoa. Yeah. And so... Four-wheel drive. So, Let's yeah, go. people could practice for 20 hours in one sitting if they wanted to, and it's not going to bleed. And you could adjust the curve. So it's like instant cut-off to full fuck. volume. Yeah. And it was like, whoa. And, yeah... I got my dad to mm. buy me one on HP from Sapphire's sort of like North <laughs> London or wherever it was. And so I got one and I was the first person in Brighton on the house scene that was flaring. You know, I remember going on three decks, wiring up my Vestax onto the left turntable and just, just mixing on the other two. Mm. And just like, I remember Billy Nasty was headlining that day and... Yeah, I, he he asked me to swap because he had a double booking. So he was going to do my slot 10 till 12 and I did 12 till 2. And I was doing flaring across Deep House and like my little bastardised hip-hop house kind of rendition what? and just smashed it. And for a little while, I was smashing it in Brighton, just doing like contemporary scratching over... House and techno, Detroit techno. And wow. but then the promoters started bringing in turntablists from all over the world. <laughs> and it was like people got bored of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're like, right, okay, we've seen the scratch perverts, we've seen craze. Oh, that, that, that pra scratch thing you're doing that's taking you 20 hours to hit this week, you're doing it now. And we're just going to talk and drink whilst <laughs> we're not going to even look at you now. <laughs> And it was yeah. like, what's the point? Yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> they get but, bored quick, you see. So Joel introduced me to Vestax, hooked me up with them, and I remember big up um, Alex Hazard and Darren from Vestax and all of those guys, Andy from Vestax. Um, I they had a thing where I exchanged my Technics for the PDX 2As or whatever they were, the black and red turntables, before they even did the PDX 2000s. And in the end, I, I, I ended up with an 07 Pro. They approached me and said, do you want this new thing? It's coming out in six months. It's an 07 Pro. It's, you can flip everything and then reflip it and do this and do that. And it's got faders for the graphic EQ. Because you've got the hamster scratch as well, which is part yeah, of yeah, that yeah, reversible. Yeah, 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 which I never thing. really didn't, I never really got on with the hamster. It was amazing, mm. but I still preferred the natural way. Um, Anyway, this comes to Tony, Tony Vegas, massive big up. If it wasn't for a conversation with him, I never would have come up with the Euro scratch. So I need to make that this clear here. Ooh, talk that shit. So Tony was about to hit the world finals in America, yeah. right? And he's like, I've got this, I've got this um, two tones. Um, you know, just continuous grooves, lock grooves of bass notes, and I'm going to use two faders to chop the sound twice. And he's like, uh, it would like, be murder if you could do it on one one hand. <laughs> <laughs> and the 07 Pro came out, and it's like this conversation echoed. So I, yeah. I can't remember how long after it was. It because wasn't. it was a lot more robust, wasn't it, for that kind of... So he was like hitting the crossfader with one hand, the up fader with the other. Yeah. And he was doing everything the wrong way round. So the what should have been the right deck fade up fader yeah. was actually wired up to be the left deck fader. Something is, like that. I yeah, think yeah. so essentially maybe it wasn't, maybe that was me that bit. But anyway, so he's chopping a sound twice. It's got a different rhythm. So instead of you know, attacking the sound and making it go transformer style. There's this different nuance. It's a there's a slight lag mm. uh, in its abruptness, and and 
so this this mixer arrived in my house. Joel had hooked me up with Vestax. They're like, right, you and your flatmate, if you want them, we can give you them. There's only 10 in the UK. Six of them are in Brighton. <laughs> 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 so... I, I, yeah, I said yes. And, and so we paid like cost for them and I got it home and I remember the echoes of Tony's. So this, this full disclosure, if it wasn't for Tony, yeah. it would never have happened. Um, I'm like, let's try and see if I can do it. Like there must be, cause this configures all sorts of ways. So I reversed the crossfader. So it's normal way round, having reversed everything. So it's back to front. Mm-hmm. So the right fader is working the left. You can do full volume instantly with the up fader. And so I'm like, I've got my middle finger. Oh God, this is good. In between the fader and the crossfader. I'm yeah. like, shit, there must be a way I can yeah. do the up and the cross yeah. at the same time. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm like, oh shit, that feels weird. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's suddenly it's going. <laughs> I'm like, oh fuck. What? Done it a little bit more. And like my I got goosebumps you even telling this fucking my story. My housemate is DJ Ideal, who is the DJ yeah. on yeah. Jest's big first album. Big up Ideal. Big, yeah, absolutely. So big up Jest as well. It's like yeah, he, he, was, he was my housemate. I'm like, Jack, get off your mixer. Come in here. I've done something. <laughs> <laughs> and he's come in and he's like, whoa, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I'm doing this scratch and he's like, let me have a go. Let me have a go. He's got on. He's got blisters almost straight away. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'm getting on the phone. So yeah. I've rung... Uh, I've I've run uh, rung Alex from Vestax. I'm like Alex, mate. Um, I've got to tell you something. Um, I've done something. Just, re- just invented a new scratch here. I've I, I've got something. It's it's fucking mind altering. It's world altering. It, it, it's yeah. mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's me. Yeah, yeah. So Coin if the pickles now. come up with it. It's mine. Yeah. All right, you heard it from me first, please. And he's like, whoa, 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 slow your roll. And I've explained it to him. He's like, okay, okay. And he's obviously cynical, fairly enough, but. I've just then thought, fuck it, I'm going to ring Joel. Yeah. Joel, look what's happened. Have you got your 0, 07 yet? Has Tony got his 07 yet? He's like, oh, I've got mine. Tony's sort of, uh, he's due to get his. And I'm like, right, okay, I've done something and it it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, no, I don't get it. And he's got his like his phones next to the decks and he's trying to, uh, he's trying to follow oh, my instructions. Man, he's like, I don't cold. get it, I don't get it. I'm like, Joel, honestly, this is like double time. It sounds like fucking... Um, What's his name? Who's the DJ? Rectangle. It sounds yeah. like him with his broken... Yeah, 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 that's right. It with sounds like that, but um, it's not the broken switch, yeah. line switch. It's me. Yeah. And he's like, ah, I'm getting in the car. And he's driven from fucking London to Brighton. And he's like, come in. He's like, what? right, out of the way. Show me, mm-hmm. show me, tell mm-hmm. me. Let's do this. Mm-hmm. And he's got on it. He's fucking ghost bumped. He's like, I can't fucking believe it. I'm like, Joel, Mad. this is mine. I'm putting my name to it. I've rung Vestax. I've told them I'm not a battle DJ. I'm never going to be a battle mm. DJ. It's just not my my role. <laughs> Can you do something with this? Can you take it? I know you've got the team battle. Can you utilise this? Yeah. It, it's for you. It's yours because you'll... Get, you'll have traction with it. Yeah. I won't. And it's like, it's my gift to you, Bruh. bud. <laughs> Bruh, that is incredible. And he took it and he used it in the first team battle, used it with the, the, the oh yes, the, the German bombers are coming in. Yeah. And he's destroyed the German bomber using the... And, and all of that. Euro scratch, baby. And then he killed A-Track with it. Yeah. At the ITF. Yeah. And it's like, sell one. Big up again. Yep. Went Long out time. with Joel because, like, at that time, I'd, I'd, wow. I'd been introduced to Neil. Neil mm. came on the scene. Big up plus one. Yes, indeed. Absolute salutations yes. to Neil. Come on. And um, we all went, like, wow. again, best mate style, went out to Denmark, to Copenhagen for the ITF heat, uh, where Neil was... The entering- junkies were there as well, weren't they? Were they there? No, no. Uh, Shortcut was judging, okay, as yeah, was... Gotcha. I can't remember the fella. I forget if you mentioned him, I'll go, yeah, it's him, but yeah. okay, my brain doesn't mm-hmm, work anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was um, It was like the whole of Europe and, and Joel and Tony... No, not Tony, sorry, beg your pardon, Neil. Neil went in the juggling category. Joel went in the scratching category. And Neil, I don't think he placed... 
first, and he should have done. No, it that's right. Because he came in late. He, he won later. Yeah. That's right. He he murdered them, but they mm. weren't ready for that. Mm. They just his routine was ridiculous. It was it, it's every bit as good as Joel's. Like Neil is gifted. He's, <laughs> he's, gifted he's a motherfucker. fucking beast. Beast. Yeah. Absolutely. He's just he's got as Joel put it once. He's got. Jo- um, Joel's hands and Tony's brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah he's he's a monster and he's he's a lovely fella to boot. And 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 Joel did, and it was lovely because he went and he won it doing the Euro scratch, and the judges were flipping, completely flipping. And he came out on stage and he's Mad. like, "I just like like to give thanks to the guy that invented this. He's given it to me to bring to this battle." And it's him there. And the whole crowd turned around. It's just like, so I, that, that I absolutely cherished. The Euro scratch. Yeah, Come I on. That. Wow. Cherished that. That was, that was a moment. And I, I was high on life for about a week, solid. Of course. <laughs> Who wouldn't? It's just nuts. Incredible. So I, I like to reiterate, thank you, Tony, for that conversation. Mm. Whilst in my hallway in Brighton in, in the late nineties, <laughs> it's the way it works, man. It is, it is. It's yeah, and yeah, it's funny. Like I remember Tony coming down to Brighton. There's a DJ contest, and he was getting ready for the ITFs with his one copy of <laughs> Bionic Booger Breaks yeah, 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 using yeah, yeah, yeah. my Uzi Ways of Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One fucking record. And, and if you don't deck. know that routine, definitely Shit. go. ITF was it ninety seven? Yeah, I remember like, like the house DJs that I was on YouTube. Yeah, the house sound system. I used to be part of for a very short minute, but I did a lot of work for him. Positive sounds, big up. Yeah, big up. They ran a DJing contest, and Tony heard through me that it was happening he's like listen I want, do you, can you fix it that I come to this DJ contest because I want to do this routine that I'm going to do at the ITF oh. so he's turned up with his one record and then there's all these guys house DJs there's some hip hop DJs as well but essentially mm. it's like two decks and they're carefully crafted mixes and this <laughs> fucking to coin the Americans oh, there's man. Huckleberry Finn with a fucking yeah, cigarette yeah, hanging right. out of his gob coming up and just like nonchalantly just fucking serving they rock stars, murder man. rock stars fucking serving murder it was God. so so it was so good. such a unique individual it was, it was and he destroyed it and I remember I was one of the judges and Dave Mothersole house DJ big up but he didn't understand it he's like He's not, he's not, how can you put him as the winner? He's only using one deck. I'm like, you have no idea what you've That's just seen. That's not point. <laughs> and I remember I it's fucking, every point. <laughs> I posted him a video cassette of Scratch Pickles versus the X-Men to fucking show the level, just to give him a bit, you know. Well, context, like, yeah. Yeah, because obviously he's coming from a very different craft, mm. you know, and he's a, he's a master DJ. Wow. And, and But yeah, it's like... What a moment in time. Tony was so ahead of the game, yeah. so ahead of the curve that it was lost on most. And yeah, fucking props. Because England was smashing it at that they point. Fuck- Man, you can't write that. You genuinely, you genuinely can't, you can't write that. That moment in time. They must have loved it in Brighton. Brighton was incredible. So Brighton was an amazing yeah. at that point. Late 90s into the early 2000s, so I held a massive DJ contest that got full sponsorship from Vestax. Well, because of the... Th- so the Vestax were... I, I was friends with yeah. each... Te- like Alex Hazard, ex-techno DJ, Covent Garden, hang around uh, uh, back in the day. He was also ex-school friend, best buddy, with a Brighton promoter called Chris Natural. They were mates. I rekindled their contact and their friendship. They you know, when you've got a scratch named decades. after you, you know, you get all these sorts well, of Well, no, it's like Chris was a mate. From <laughs> yeah. He was a promoter. He used to do these parties. He still does. Mm. He does scar things as well. And he's just like all round super good egg. Fantastic mm. fella. But him and... <laughs> him and anyway, that's not <laughs> too much. So but stories are suddenly... Right, I, right. I, I suddenly realised they knew each other. Really? And so Chris Natural used to put on the Zen raves at Slough Centre. And I remember him coming into Brighton the first time he entered Jelly Jam Records Mm -hmm. and saying, I've got tickets for my family's rave. Like his mum did the door, he did organise the DJs Mm -hmm. and his dad did security. Wow. It's a family concern. Wow. And they're a really wholesome family. Lovely. Flipping brilliant. Wow. And Chris is still plying his trade as a promoter. Uh, Lunacy in Brighton was his 
Full Moon Party was, was yeah, that's that's it. It's the, full and moon, then yeah. um, Jungleism. At the, so they're, they're his. They're his. They're his babies. And he does uh, Scar Train. I think it's called now. It's uh, he has Jerry Dam has come through. I forget the name. Forgive me for this, but he's Madness's mm. tour DJ. Wow, his resident. And they're amazing nights. By all accounts, I've only been to one of them because obviously I don't really go clubbing anymore. No. But what is life like now? Up. What is life like now? Uh, failed marriage, <laughs> child from that, okay. seventeen years old. Stefan, amazing, amazing kid. He's, Big up, Stefan. He's amazing go karter. He's done really well at school and stuff. He's just finished his A levels. He does custom painting of go kart helmets for people. Really? Wow. At seventeen years of age. He's wow. Into double digits, thousands uh, really? revenue from that. So fantastic! Wow, lovely, lovely, lovely son. I love him to death. And then I've got. I'm currently in a failed relationship in a in a house, and we're selling. I've got five year old with her and a stepson, and so that's taken up a lot of my energy. Yeah. Two two failed relationships, and yes, yeah, taking the shit out of the sale. Mm. Um, so. Sure, it's the same for quite a lot of people. Mm. But yeah, my my son, I doubt on my son, Otis, he's only little. He's big up fun. Otis. He's, yeah, Otis. He's we see you. Really into b boying. Mm. He's really funny. Born he's, into the game. He's really into b boying. He mm. loves it. And yeah, I see some some forward momentum with that one. Yes, yes, that. yes. Uh, some... yeah. So both of my boys, I'm super proud of them. They're amazing. It's fucking amazing, man. That's the shape of life. And I've just rekindled my interest in, in who I was because I got because of these distractions, I forgot who I was. Positive distractions, but but yeah, I positive, know what you mean. but yeah, it's life like distractions. I, I I I I'm revisiting who I was now mm. and massive respect to you for bringing me on this because it's it feels oh, like brother. everything that's coming together again. Mm. This is part of that journey. So I really appreciate you coming on, man. For that. Yeah. I mean life is full of mini lives, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I've got my music thing. The, the music thing is, is I've been involved in electro for a really long time and I had a record label until 2002, uh, ran for a little while. I was like, there's, there's so much more. There's wow. much more story. There's yeah. much more. Don't doubt but that for a second. But essentially, I'm starting to record electro again and, yeah, that's that's been my focus. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, so big up to Scape One. People like um, Bass Junkie, Phil Klein, mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, Andy Jaggers, ADJ, uh, Steve Faulkner from back in the day when mm -hmm. I was doing my electro things. And Electro's yeah. coming back. Like oh, It's been around. It's like, I, no, I, but there's a certain thing that's, there's something about, I mean, Prime Cuts is what I've been privy to hearing some of his new stuff, um, a lot of his new stuff. But you've got other DJs, like I, I was involved in the techno scene and stuff like that, and you've got people like Jayfee, who's big up jayfee.co.uk mm -hmm. in uh, St. Leonard's next to Hastings. Yep. Um, he is an international mm. record retailer, but he also sells collections. He's selling my old collection of electro from the late 90s, noughties, sort of, time mm. um and then alex downey from brighton um again these are all people that are representing electro mm. um as well and and yeah that's 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 very much where i'm at I, but i'm much more from the hip-hop angle because mm -hmm. it's it's also seen as a the original techno form it's the attitude as well you know the hip-hop attitude i mean the, the, a lot of it is is very fluid sounding or very ethereal. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely coming from the more hip hop side and, mm. and certainly Joel will be coming from that, that hard hitting programming. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's the thing that, that makes me buzz out of it. So that, that's very much what I, I try and juggle when I'm really tired coming home from work. I might rock a beat on an NPC and mm -hmm. then put it into my studio. And yeah, so that's a work in progress and it's going on. But mm -hmm. yeah, had a label called Remote Audio uh, had releases on Blue Juice Music, Big Up Ziggy and Graham uh, in Brighton, sort of 2000. Mm -hmm. So for me at that time, a high point was walking into the local HMV and seeing my record right <laughs> right across an aisle just as the featured oh, record yeah. of the week sort of thing. That was nice. Yeah, yeah, of course. And that was the Euro Scratch EP. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So that was me rocking the Euro Scratch for the first time on vinyl. 
and I had Scape One and then Transparent Sound, who Transparent Sound are legendary in UK electro. Right. And Scape One used to be part of that. They're Bogner based. And, you know, it might be a really good thing for you to interview Scape yeah, One. Yeah, I love that. To be wow. Honest. Or nice. Awesome Bramley. They're, they're, they're like, yeah, they're really, they're wow. fundamental to UK electro. Yeah. Absolutely fundamental. So, yeah. Well, we're talking about uh, South Coast. It can't go without saying uh, "Rest in Peace, Fire" and yeah. um, and uh, the Moon. Um, that that whole a- era of graph, which you know, fired for so, me. You know, the Moon. That was me and two other individuals were on our way to something that was happening because of a certain inability for something to operate <laughs> for the day. <laughs> okay. We were going okay. somewhere destined to do something. And certain things that aren't able to operate, yeah. Maybe shouldn't have been able to do or shouldn't be doing, but we were going to for the interests of cultural um, movement. <laughs> <laughs> do the math, yeah. <laughs> um, and we're going past Shoreham on a double-decker coach. And I see with the two individuals with me, we see this holding pen of some like this dockside kind of yeah. thing. It's massive. It's like the size of two or three football pitches, wide and big. Huge. And it's got like 40, 30, 40 foot walls and like high. And I'm like, I've earmarked it. We're like, we all said that that'd be amazing as a Hall of Fame, right? <clears throat> so I've got on a bicycle that week because I wasn't driving at the time. And during the week, I went down on my own and I've looked at it and I reported back to the others, found something. (laughs) Oh, shit. (laughs) And Nima named it the moon because it had this dust. Yeah. It was a sand quarry, wasn't it, essentially? No, 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 no. It's it's, it's a a shipping holding key. But what what was all the sand for then? It wasn't sand. It was some sort of ore. It's whatever... Whatever kind of mineral of or somewhat, it was held there. And I suspect it was polluted ground and therefore not able to be utilised for a certain amount of time. Mm-hmm. But they used to hold raves in there and everything. But I remember first going down there, it was about eight inches deep, grey dust, hence the name. It was noxious. And I remember I dug out... It, so I'm the first one that went down there. The others came down. Score and Nima painted the first completed piece. I had started digging out a wall. I did it on my own in entirety. It's about 13 foot, foot tall, that section, maybe touching 15. I can't mm-hmm. remember, but I used I had to stand on a steel drum that was down there to reach the top. But I had to go down there three visits to dig it out from this dust that had been windswept up against it, like like snow drifts. And I did the whole thing on my own. I I did a Euro piece and then Dar Freeze Mob and then Southbreed, which was a rap project that I was involved in at the time. So like three massive pieces that were one huge mural. So you were the first person to do the moon? I wasn't the first. I'd, I'd gone and started it, but Nima and Score rocked the first pieces. Like Score did a Hellraiser's characters, as in, what? you know, Pinhead, the, yeah. the horror film, Clive Barker horror film. Um, yeah, and those two finished the first two pieces. And and so we. it was a world-famous Hall yeah, of Fame. It People was. like Giant came from San Francisco. People from Holland, I can't, I can't remember the fella. Melly from... I used to go down there all the time. Yeah, it was amazing. And they ended up holding raves there. And it's now been dug out and it's reappropriated as its origin, original con, concern. Really? The holding pen for materials to go on some <sighs> cargo boats. Fuck. Yeah, yeah. No, no, you know. Jesus And that Christ. is insane. Yeah. Incredible. So those were magic times and the best, I think the best, the most landmark thing of all to happen down there. I mean, Rec had, Rec was signed to Skin. Yeah, that's right. I mean, one of my records, I did a record with Rec, a seven inch single, and we had a photo, uh, a photographer assigned to us and a TV crew came down and they filmed us and photoed us painting the cover for mm. our record and it made the local news magazine program sort of after the six o'clock news whatever yeah yeah you know sort of thing the equivalent of that that was uh recorded about me and my studio in my room and and then yeah wow film footage of us painting but the best thing of all was jason brassil uh from our crew who was 
and then Ray, whose name was real name was Jim Murray. They were the character artists in the the, the Nusty, Dusty Nights, mm. our crew. Um, they were 2000 AD cover artists, what? so they were graphic novelists. And at the time, they had uh, they joined for the 2000 AD joined forces with DC Comics and did a Judge Dredd versus Batman <gasps> graphic novel. And it was those two. And so you had their piece. They did the bug piece on that original wall that I did. Uh, so it said bug, I think, as I recall, and it had two Transformer robots. And Jim Murray had never painted graffiti ever, and it looked like he'd done it for 40 years. Oh, these people. Yes. (laughs) So he's he's an airbrush artist, essentially. He just rocked this wall, and it was unreal. And uh, I remember graffitism really showing us some love at that point, especially those guys. And so Wreck had his – he did – because he was signed to Skint and released three albums for him. He did a – a whole load of well, like a kind of pop video but documentary sort of thing on him and the Brighton graffiti scene. A lot of it was shot down there on Super 8 wow. by um, Pablo Fiasco, who's an amazing, um, mm. amazing creative who does these very old looking, because he uses Super 8, yeah. he'll do these bits of film and they look like they're done in the 50s or early 70s, but they're oh. not, they're contemporary, they're, they're amazing. Um, and then, yeah, so Jim Murray and um, Jason Brashill, they did this wall, Angels, and it's Angels versus Demons, and you're talking like this character, he must have been about four foot wide and about ten, eight foot tall, muscular demon punching an angel. And, and th- 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 just, it was like, f- like, it's just, Put your cans down and give up. This is this is this is unreal. A whole other levels. Yeah, completely. Like you know, you're talking. By this point, the whole etiquette of halls of fame had disappeared. Mm. Compared to, I mean, it's on. It was, you know, like the Earth's Edge by No Limits. It's yeah. kind of like that sort of gravity of wow factor. <sighs> um, but yeah, oh, oh man, that was a blessed, blessed place. Yeah. And it burnt brightly for a while. Rest in peace, the moon. Wow. Yeah. Brighton has and continues to have a shining star in graph. Yeah, yeah, it does. You know? yeah. Fucking beautiful. Brother, it's been an absolute pleasure. I mean, we yes, can't fight. we've already been here all afternoon, haven't we, to be fair? But <laughs> it's been an absolute <laughs> no, fucking mate, pleasure. Yeah, it's it's um yeah, it's it's just I think yeah, it's it's a significant tale to tell. Everyone knows that Brighton has a Bristol kind of connect, element, connect, yeah. or not connect, but contribution to yeah. the big time cultural circle or scene. And, yeah, it's it's like Bristol gets sung about quite a lot. Brighton mm. has had its time. but yeah, Big time. But I think people need to sort of know exactly what was happening. And mm. I'd love to see you interview She or Wreck, oh, or people like that. Cause... I'll, give it, I'll definitely give a testy to have She and Wreck in, without question. They're just, we've talked about Rec, you know, and his involvement in my informative years, man. Yeah. Fucking, I would love that. Um, yeah. Brighton, uh, hail up. And of course, my brother. Yes, it's my been friend. such a pleasure. No, it's been lovely. Euro lovely. in the place. Come on. Um, big up Arrow, of course, and everybody big else up. that is still holding court over uh, in Southsides. And uh, moreover, thank you all for tuning in. It's been another great podcast. Um, crime don't pay, neither do they. And so is your right. If you think otherwise, uh, <laughs> stay lucky. Don't talk to anyone I wouldn't. Um, and yeah, take care. Nice one, Euro. Nice one. Easy. Wow.